here in uh, Tashkent, despite the difficult circumstances that we're all confronting. Hopefully we're over the worst of the COVID pandemic. And as was explained in the opening session, there are many participants here, some who've flown from the other end of the earth, Miami no less to be here, Moscow, London, the Middle East, which is a reflection of the importance of Uzbekistan to the international legal community and the business community. This session will deal with the issues that concern investment in Uzbekistan. I'm delighted that the Deputy Minister of Finance is here, uh, Mr. His Excellency Izakov. He will uh, address us in his uh, keynote presentation and provide us with an overview of some of the major changes that are taking place. And then we'll have Mr. Nuritnov, uh, followed by uh, Tom Schneider, a partner at Altamimi Law Firm who will be joining online. He has been involved in the drafting and formulation of the new arbitration law of Uzbekistan. He'll share his insight and his experience. As many of you are aware, over the past 15 years, uh, Dubai, the international financial center of Dubai, modeled on English law principles, has sought to establish itself as a regional financial center and also a dispute resolution center uh, to uh, some degree, with some degree of success. It's clear that the the momentum that Uzbekistan has developed, the vision of the leadership has been reflected in very significant positive changes over the past five years. Are there lessons to be learned from other centers such as Dubai? Most certainly. You'll have uh, uh, additional insight from uh, Mr. Nuritnov and Mr. Muratlov uh, concerning the types of investment that have taken place in Uzbekistan and some of the key issues that investors are facing. Uh, I'm conscious of the fact that we have lunch at one o'clock, so hopefully all of the speakers will stick to the allotted time. But without further interruption, I invite His Excellency, Mr. Isakov to address it. Your Excellency. Uh, thank you, Professor Qureshi. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those who have come from abroad, welcome to Uzbekistan, welcome to Tashkent, and I'm hoping that you're enjoying our hospitality and uh, the weather, which is now much uh, cooler versus last week. Um, my topic was uh, five ways the investment landscape changed in Uzbekistan, overview of projects and initiatives and importance of dispute avoidance and management. We have... Uh, uh, it's been uh, exactly five years since a change have uh, started happening in Uzbekistan. That's when we started opening up. Uh, this is when um, Uzbekistan um, initially uh, in, the, in the first, first years uh, of the new administration, uh, they've completed very successful reforms to attract investments and create um, very conducive um, ecosystem for foreign investors in Uzbekistan. Number one is, of course, uh, liberalization, economic liberalization, FX liberalization, also now uh, been uh, near exactly four years. It was also early September 2017, which led the way for uh, people to actually invest money freely convert their um, local currencies into hard currencies and take the profits away. That was number one condition for any foreign investor to come to Uzbekistan. Uh, of course, this, this was followed by trade liberalization. This was followed by uh, uh, the um, tax um, reforms where the taxes have been significantly cut uh, we have a uh, personal income tax of 12% flat for those who are coming from Europe or UK. That's probably music to your ears. Um, and we also have um, a significant reduction in terms of corporation tax, also 12 to 15%, depending on the industry. Uh, VAT was also cut to 15%. 
Several other taxes and duties were abolished. Several tariffs, non-tariff barriers to trade was also abolished. And therefore, uh, this uh, liberalization effort, I would say, one of the first gate openers to change the investment landscape in Uzbekistan. Uh, secondly, of course, um, us getting um, internationally recognized ratings, credit rating, which we uh, obtained in 2018, so three years ago, uh, BB minus from SMP and BB minus from um, Fitch uh, was also quite important because that meant that we <clears throat> had to um, open up lots of previously classified information. For example, how much Uzbekistan was producing gold and, and other types of very important economic information was classified. And that was also now uh, changed. And we had to open it because of the ratings. Much more openness, much more transparency led to led us to, to be able to actually showcase Uzbekistan's full economic potential. And therefore, despite the fact that our fiscal uh, and macro stability is, was uh, quite highly rated by those rating agencies, um, uh, our institutional factors, including rule of law, um, corruption, uh, perception index, and many other institutional uh, rankings actually pulled us down to double B minus and uh, to date we remain to be rated double significant improvements in institutional factors over the last five years as well of course that uh, uh, international focus on international ratings and international rankings doing the right thing um, is not just to you know jump from one place to another place it's actually ensuring that the change is real on the ground, whether it's economic, whether it's political, legal, or other types of reforms, um, especially rule of law, uh, has a paramount, paramount importance uh, for, for us, uh, for, for the economic policy to attract investments, not just foreign direct investments, but also to attract private investments from our own people. I would say the third important um, um, factor uh, is SOE reforms and uh, SOE and SOB, so state-owned enterprises and state-owned bank reforms that's currently happening in Uzbekistan. Uh, we have in some cases started early on, in some cases um, uh, a little bit late, uh, but however, um, last year, President uh, signed a decree uh, back in October uh, which lists how many companies we have to keep, which lists how many companies we have to sell, uh, transform, modernize, or in some cases, close it down. If it has no value to people, if it has no value to the government, then we, we just can close these companies down. And therefore, uh, now, Ministry of Finance, together with State Asset Management Agency, we're working very hard to ensure that uh, state-owned enterprise and state-owned banks are transformed with the help of likes of IFC, EBRD, Asian Development Bank. In some cases, um, we have uh, involved um, such leading consulting firms like BCG or McKinsey uh, in terms of debt advisory, debt restructuring, likes of Rothschilds. And all of these uh, world-renowned companies or IFIs are, are helping us to reform sectors, reform the companies, hire um, uh, C-suite or independent board members, and also improve their corporate governance. Uh, in fact, we hired uh, over 30 people to be represented in our state-owned bank uh, supervisory boards, which was also quite an important step towards actually um, um, uh, improving corporate governance. And of course, there are some early results in terms of privatization as well. All of you may have heard 
about the Coca-Cola privatization, the state stake, extremely successful case in Uzbekistan. I was also involved in, uh, in that uh, uh, privatization effort. And uh, it was, in my opinion, um, uh, much better than expected, both in terms of the process and the price we achieved uh, than we initially envisaged. Apart from Coca-Cola, several other smaller assets, banks, are also put for sale. And the trans uh, privatization effort is bringing us uh, investments, bringing us, giving the uh, firms into the private sector. And we are all sure that private sector is a better operator. Um, another important uh, area, I would say, uh, relevant in this uh, uh, conference is public-private partnership. My colleague, Nodar Nordinov is here. He will talk more about PPPs, but what I can say is the number of deals we've closed so far and the several other deals that we're working on, which means that Uzbekistan's public-private partnership program will further expand. It will bring billions of dollars of investments in Uzbekistan, but also the fact that in many of our PPP agreements or government support agreements, we have arbitration clauses, whether it's LTIA or some other arbitration clauses, means that we're gonna have to work with you guys very closely in, all, in most of these transactions. And hopefully it will never come to the arbitration, but you never know with PPP projects. Um, and the, uh, with this, um, I, would like to, I would like to conclude by uh, thanking you all uh, for coming over to Uzbekistan, thanking you all for your continued interest in the development of our country. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, this conference will be a success and uh, which will lead to um, a very um, engaged, very, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, it, it would lead to a dialogue, dialogue, discussions, and hopefully all the participants uh, will take a lot more than they, they, they were hoping uh, in this conference. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. You can uh, derive from that the emphasis that the uh, leadership is placing upon reform, uh, openness, transparency, and underpinned by the rule of law, all fundamental so far as the uh, landscape is concerned for business and foreign investment. I'm uh, delighted now to welcome virtually Tom Schneider, who hopefully will join us uh, via the video link from Dubai and addresses briefly on the changes in the arbitral law. Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Qureshi, let me just confirm uh, that you can indeed hear me okay. We can hear you. Excellent. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start by saying how much I regret uh, not being able to be there in person uh, for this important event. Uh, uh, circumstances, uh, unfortunately, did not permit me to do so, but I hope uh, to be back in Tashkent uh, uh, very soon. Um, I think I'd like to start my comments by saying a warm congratulations to uh, the Republic of Uzbekistan, all of the stakeholders uh, and, and supporting organizations that were involved in the passage of this important uh, new law. Um, obviously, the Ministry of Justice, the Chamber of Commerce, TIAC, and other stakeholders uh, played an important role uh, in pushing this through. I had the opportunity to work um, uh, as the lead international arbitration expert with the Asian Development Bank uh, in this process and their provision of technical assistance uh, to the government. So I appreciate the support they provided. Uh, and I want to make a special mention of my Uzbekistan law expert that worked closely with me, Shurzad Bek uh, Masadikov. Uh, this really is an important piece of legislation. It was uh, passed by the Senate, I believe, one year ago this week, signed uh, by the president of Uzbekistan in February of this year, and just came into force uh, last month in August of 2021. The, um, 
The international commercial, commercial arbitration law is broadly in line with the UNCTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration. I think this is particularly important because one of the first things that we ask as an arbitration practitioner when we're considering where to seat an arbitration is whether the jurisdiction is a jurisdiction that has uh, based its le legislation on the UNCTRAL model law. Um, that's sort of a quick stamp of approval to confirm that the law uh, contains uh, international norms on arbitration and uh, the, the latest features that one would expect uh, to see in a national uh, arbitration law. Um, UNCTRAL has already recognized Uzbekistan's international commercial arbitration law as being model law compliant. And if you were to uh, read through the new international commercial arbitration law, uh, you would be forgiven uh, if you thought you were reading the model law uh, directly. It is based very uh, closely on uh, the uh, UNCTRAL model law. The, the passage of the new international commercial arbitration law for Uzbekistan really is part and parcel of the uh, process and the initiatives that His Excellency, the Deputy Minister, uh, outlined in his opening remarks. Uh, this law will help to attract foreign investment uh, into Uzbekistan by providing for an effective uh, cross-border commercial dispute resolution uh, regime in the country. It will help improve uh, predictability and confidence in the legal framework uh, in Uzbekistan. It will help to bolster Uzbekistan's position as a reliable seat of arbitration in the region and, and hopefully in due course uh, globally. Uh, it will also help to improve Uzbekistan's international standing in various indices uh, and rankings. The um, international commercial law, commercial arbitration law is very much what you would expect to see in a law that's based on the UNCTRAL model law. It goes through the entire life cycle uh, of an arbitration, beginning uh, with provisions on the arbitration agreement, uh, on the jurisdiction and composition of the arbitral tribunal. Uh, it addresses interim measures, the conduct of arbitral proceedings, the making of awards, and uh, the very limited uh, means of recourse against arbitral awards. Um, since time is tight, I, I think I'll just use my remaining uh, minutes to highlight some of the unique features of the new international commercial arbitration law uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, just a few examples where uh, the law does depart from uh, the UNCTRAL uh, model law uh, in ways that I think are uh, very uh, good, very important. I think these departures really add value uh, uh, to the new law. Uh, the, the first deviation I'd like to, or, or, or unique feature I'd like to uh, emphasize is found in Article 6 of the uh, new law, which provides uh, expressly uh, for immunity of arbitrators, experts, uh, uh, tribunal appointed experts, arbitral institutions, and employees of arbitral institutions. I think this is an important provision that sort of provides uh, confidence and security to uh, the, the, the key players in the arbitral process to make sure that they are able to do uh, their job uh, without fear of, of uh, other proceedings uh, taking place. Um, Article 7 of the new law uh, is an interesting provision um, that is entitled Independence of the Arbitral Tribunal. Um, and it makes clear that any intervention with arbitral tribunals is impermissible. Now, I think this is a provision that should be read along with Article 8 of the new law on the extent of court intervention. Article 8 is a provision that reflects Article 5 of the UNCTRAL model law uh, that simply makes clear that uh, there is to be no court intervention in the arbitral process except where such intervention is specifically provided for in the new law. And I think the addition of Article 7 on the independence of arbitral tribunals uh, is really just uh, intended to drive that point home to ensure the independence of the arbitral uh, process. Another new provision is found in Article 38 uh, that relates to representation in arbitral proceedings. 
uh, and makes clear that uh, parties can be representative, uh, represented by individuals of their choice, uh, including uh, foreign organizations, foreign law firms, uh, and individuals. There's an interesting new provision in Article 50, uh, which I like to highlight. Article 50 um, reflects Article 34 of the Uncontrolled Model Law. It, it sets forth the very limited grounds for setting aside an award. These are the uh, very familiar grounds that uh, arbitration practitioners will uh, recognize. Uh, found in the Uncitral Model Law. Um, but at the end of this Article 50, there is a new provision that sort of, uh, that, that, that says that um, courts uh, confronted with a set-aside application are not entitled to reconsider the award on the merits. Now, from one perspective, that sort of goes without saying. The, the limited grounds in Article 34 of the Uncitral Model Law or Article 50 of this law are limited broadly speaking to jurisdictional issues, procedural issues, and public policy issues. Um, it's implicit that a review on the merits uh, is not permissible, but I think having that expressed language at the end of Article 50 confirming that awards cannot be reconsidered on the merits just provides an added layer of comfort to uh, foreign investors and businesses that may be new to Uzbekistan for the first time. Uh, just two more provisions that I'll mention and then I'll turn the floor back over. Article 53 confirms um, that the arbitral process will be confidential, uh, save for some very limited uh, uh, exceptions. And Article 54 uh, is an interesting uh, provision that uh, calls for the Ministry of Justice, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and other interested organizations to have a role, to play a role, uh, in explaining the law and its concepts to the public at large, to sort of uh, uh, get the word out there, uh, help develop capacity um, and uh, ensure that the arbitral process in Uzbekistan seated arbitrations continues to thrive. So uh, that's a broad overview of the, of the new law. Once again, congratulations to the Republic of Uzbekistan on this important development. And uh, uh, it's a good law that's based on the Uncitral Model Law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for that brief and succinct overview of the major changes brought about by the new legislation, uh, emphasizing court support, not interference, party choice, and finality of the arbitral process. These are the key requirements for successful arbitration in terms of the, the success of a, of, of a particular jurisdiction as it seeks. I understand uh, His Excellency, uh, Deputy Minister Isakov has to leave for another formal uh, engagement. And I'm very pleased that he was able to, to join us in a very busy schedule. And his comments have been extremely helpful. Thank you. Next, I'll hand over to uh, the uh, speaker who will address us on uh, public-private partnership, Mr. Nadir Nuritinov. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Nadir Nuritinov. I am the uh, Deputy Director of PPP Development Agency. So uh, when talking about the ways uh, that uh, Uzbekistan has uh, really changed in the uh, last few years, uh, one thing which is worth mentioning and uh, which without which no reforms and no uh, uh, programs would ever be successful is the uh, political resolve and the uh, support from the highest levels of the government. So uh, in establishing all of the uh, new efforts by the government, be it uh, public-private partnership, the privatization program, or any other reforms for that matter, the ones that Mr. Isakov before, before me has mentioned, uh, the uh, 
political will to carry those, to see those uh, reforms through have been paramount and have been uh, very, very important in that field. And uh, as a result of that, we have a number of initiatives and uh, public-private partnership uh, is uh, one of uh, many uh, to uh, mention. Now, um, as everybody knows, no uh, new um, program would succeed without the proper uh, legislative framework uh, to carry those uh, programs through. So uh, the first thing that uh, has been done in this country in 2018 is the law on public-private partnership was passed and a number of uh, legislature uh, documents have been adapted in order to uh, create a proper uh, legal framework for uh, public-private partnerships. Now, um, everybody knows that uh, the government's uh, running of uh, economy is not always efficient. And uh, just looking at uh, past 30 years uh, of Uzbekistan would be a stark example uh, of the fact that the presence of the government in main uh, fields of uh, economy and uh, commercial activity is not going to be bringing as efficient results as what private partners, pri private parties would have, have done otherwise. And the government uh, recognizes this, and that's why there have been quite a number of efforts uh, by the state agency, uh, state asset agency, uh, where my good friend Akram Gulov is present in privatizing the assets. However, not all of the uh, roles of governments could be delegated to private uh, companies if you, uh, because um, there obviously are going to be clashes of the objectives in uh, obviously private parties, private companies' main uh, objectives is profit maximization, whilst the government has to carry out social and economic and other reforms as well. Therefore, public-private partnership is quite important to fill that gap because public-private partnership not only sources the finances of, public, of, of private sector, but also brings about the expertise and uh, the uh, efficiencies uh, that private par uh, parties uh, usually carry out. So uh, the um, resolute of the government to involve private partners in the fields of services that the government otherwise provides is quite important as well. Now, uh, in, the far, in, in the past two years, since the uh, PPP law has been adapted and since the PPP Development Agency has been established, we have a number of projects that have been quite successful in that field and not to mention the, uh, in the field of energy. In the field of energy, we have managed to get the record low uh, tariffs of uh, 1.8 cents per kilowatt, which is, I believe, it's amongst the lowest in the top five lowest tariffs around the world. This shows that uh, not only the reforms are working, but the private sector uh, has put trust in those reforms in Uzbekistan as well. Uh, otherwise, those uh, tariffs would have been pretty impossible to, to attract. And uh, the projects uh, now are not just limited to energy sector. We have projects in the drinking water and sewerage. We have projects uh, in the uh, healthcare, in education, and in uh, any of the uh, fields that we can think about, the transport, the roads, and, and uh, amongst others as well. In fact, our pipeline today is uh, around 6 billion US dollars and it's growing by day as well. We're working on a number of initiatives and number of projects uh, where the pipeline will grow even further. Now, uh, our aim is to uh, balance out the uh, private uh, companies' participation whilst also uh, providing the, uh, the services that uh, government constitutionally has to provide to the people. And we believe that the involvement of uh, private sector in the, all of the fields of economy will be a win-win situation for all of the stakeholders involved and uh, especially for the population in, in large where they are going to be uh, getting a good quality service with the value for money um, uh, fundamentals in it. Thank you very much for, for having me.
Thank you, Mr. Nudninov. Our final speaker before we open up uh, for questions and observations is Mr. Mohamed Slof, who will address us in more detail about some of the projects that have taken place and some of the investments that are uh, coming into Uzbekistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, distinguished guests, uh, participants of the, of the forum, I have to apologize for, for being late because I thought I would be... Uh, I will be presenting online. You see my, uh, I think I'm right there, which means that I'm here in spirit and body. So I just decided to uh, join you here when I saw these beautiful pictures. Um, I have to join uh, uh, what my colleagues, uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Isakov was saying, and also uh, my good friend, Mr. Nuridinov, uh, about the fact that Uzbekistan is open for investment. You know that uh, uh, since uh, 2017, when uh, our president, His Excellency Mr. Mirziyoyev, said that uh, we need to open Uzbekistan, this is new Uzbekistan, it has to be open to investment, has to be open to business, to entrepreneurship. That means that uh, we had to introduce uh, certain uh, changes in policy, in legislation and practice. Uh, I here represent the uh, agency for uh, state asset management. Uh, my current role is uh, head of department for transformation and privatization of state assets, of large state assets. Um, uh, prior to this, for one year, I was uh, CEO and the deputy CEO also of uh, the so-called US Assets Investment Company. It's a specialized um, body uh, within uh, USAMA, uh, the agency which was actually going through privatization of state assets. Now, I will try to touch upon uh, several key points in terms of policy legislation and, and uh, practice without sort of, uh, going too much, but, but trying to sort of uh, approximate it more to uh, legal scholars and practitioners that, that sit here so that you can pinpoint uh, some of the aspects in privatization that would be relevant to your current work, future work. Uh, as, 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 as I mentioned, um, we, uh, um, the president in October uh, 2000, uh, uh, 20 uh, issued a decree, which is decree 6096. I just just bear with me, uh, especially the, the legal scholars, which is what I, because I need to present to you the basis of uh, what we work upon. This this decree 1696 it, it provided for us a kind of framework framework within which we move along in terms of um, the management of so, so a management of state assets and in terms of uh, denationalization or privatization of state assets. Because the idea was first to, to divide all the large states, because Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbek government owns about 2.5 thousand uh, assets. The presence of economy, the uh, presence of government in the economy is very high, is about 50%, which is higher regionally and uh, even more so global, globally and among the developed countries. So the primary target is to reduce that uh, number and uh, as Nodir mentioned, that some mm, large uh, companies, they, they are natural monopolies or, or, or unnatural monopolies, but they, they form a sort of social, uh, uh, also social role. So in this, in, this, in this presidential decree, you will see that they're split into five groups. So there are these large assets, which are managed by the Ministry of Finance, where there is certain transformation is ongoing. Then there's a second list of also fairly large assets which undergo corporate transformation, so-called. And third list onward, there is about 1.5 thousand companies. They are up for sale. So within that list, we earmark certain companies that, that are large, that require specific uh, roadmap or sort of attention to sell them individually. So within that role of individually selling certain state assets, we have, we have uh, uh, under our initiative, we, we also uh, adopted, the president adopted two more decrees, uh, presidential decree 61, 67, and also presidential decree 62, 73. Why I mentioned these decrees is that if you take the framework, we just pulled aside certain lists, short lists of assets that we're selling now. Uh, and these two, two last uh, decrees allowed us within the legislation to take action in terms of privatization. Why I mention this is because privatization law itself, 
privatization and denationalization law was adopted in 1991, it actually doesn't correspond to what we do currently in terms of practice, because we need to move forward in terms of valuation of companies. We had problems in terms of methodologies of sale. I will touch upon that a bit later. So we, these, these two degrees, they actually paved the way for us to instantly move into practice until the law, the new law on privatization, which we have developed, and it's a draft law now, which we are now um, circulating it among uh, other government entities. And by the end of the year, the target is to adopt this law. So once the law will be adopted, it will be above uh, all the other uh, legislation, you know, in terms of the preeminence of the law. So we will have all in one place in, in terms of um, ownership of state assets. It should be one body in terms of uh, individual programs for privatization, in terms of approaches to privatization, valuation, methodology, everything is in one law. So we knew that, but to speed up the process of privatization, we came up, as I mentioned, uh, the, through several presidential degrees, which actually allowed us to move into concrete practice now. So uh, in terms of um, privatization of assets, so uh, previously what we had is uh, a problem we had with valuation of assets because when locally evaluated, under locally evaluated rules, the valuation was too high and the investors, they wouldn't respond to, to these high valuations basically. So, so then the asset would be, would be put up on the stock exchange, but there would be no bidders, right? So what we did now is we're trying to reform our uh, valuation methodology and also uh, uh, valuation, um, uh, there, are, there are these rules with the, together with the World Bank. And now valuation is only taken as an indicative price. So meaning when we announce the asset for sale, we don't actually announce the price. So we're not bound by the price. Our, uh, all of our large assets are sold with the attraction of um, uh, advisors. So we had lead advisors, specifically these are big four companies that, uh, in, in, in a way, you, you can say that practice precedes a bit the legislation. You could, you could say that because in terms of methodology, in terms of valuation, in terms of how we engage with investors, in, in terms of how we structure our SPA, special per, uh, sales purchase agreements, where really legal uh, teams are putting up the, the final details on the deal, we're actually far advanced already, the legislation. So, so by the end of the year, when the law is there, we, we, believe that, uh, we believe that it will be all in place, but we do that to proceed with privatization and to bring in foreign investors, right? So all of our large assets are sold with the advisory of, uh, as I mentioned, of legal firms, established legal firms, fairly big names like Dentons, for instance. And uh, the big four, they are our advisors in terms of pre-sale preparation of companies. Now, pre-sale preparation it depends on uh, who here is uh, into practice of, uh, of uh, mergers acquisitions. You know that you know there is due diligence that you have to put together. There's a proper fundamental uh, uh, diligence of the company, legal, um, uh, tax, and then financial that we then present to the investors. So we do that uh, so that investors that come here, they understand that, that we too understand on behalf of the government of how to sell that asset, what the practice is, so that it's not only uh, 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 put up for sale for local uh, investors, but also for foreign investors. So we do make sure that we go through all the stages that investors are used to in terms of preparation of the company that will put for sale, in terms of investor signing, in terms of information memorandums, in terms of teasers, in terms of creating VDRs, uh, uh, in terms of giving access, having all the negotiations, because to sell an asset, it might take between six, nine, 12 months, depending on the size of the asset. Then uh, when coming to the specifically legal side of things, I can tell you specifically me and my other colleagues as well, very recently in SPAs, in sales purchase agreements of, of companies that we are selling, we put a provision which says arbitration, we, we suggest to, to the buyer, arbitration should be, should be made in TIAC. So that's our small uh, tangible and intangible contribution to, uh, to development of TIAC. So uh, if, if the bidder agrees to that, 
you know, that stays in the agreement. If the bidder says, no, we have to put London courts, I mean, you know, Paris courts, etc., then we have to, uh, but, but, but we can tell you that we try to push all the new buyers uh, to come to TIAC for any possible, hopefully no arbitration, but, uh, but any possible uh, arbitration. And uh, in terms of how we structure our, our, our agreements, legal agreements, SPAs, etc., we already adopted uh, international legal practice because, because our, our, uh, our legal teams, especially, because we, we, we do, we have to admit that in terms of legal preparation, in terms of sort of legal side of things, we are not that strong yet. But because we, we attract uh, legal companies into every sale, they tell us what to do and what not to do, what to say, what not to say, etc. So we're kind of, uh, I have to say we're learning, but it's a very interesting uh, process. So, so in, in that way, we, we're also learning from every deal that we participate in. So uh, in short, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we have. We currently have quite a number of large sale, uh, large assets on sale. We, we have... If you, if you look at, if, if we have legal people here, you, you can look at 61, 67, uh, presidential degree and 62, 72, you will have the list of assets. They're split into two parts. One is um, real estate. For instance, uh, Hayat, somewhere here on the le left side, we will put up for sale very soon. So these are large, attractive uh, assets that are located in the capital. And we also have quite a few assets that are part of... Uh, um, various kind of industries, large to medium to small, that will be continuously putting up also. Why I say that is because more deals there are, more investors that come here, more consultants that we bring in, I think eventually more work that you will have. Because, I mean, hopefully we will avoid any arbitration, but, but since there is this tool, for you to understand that there is a background, Uzbekistan is opening, we are putting uh, assets for sale. There are deals, there are concrete deals. Uh, for instance, we, we're already in, in the lockup for, for uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, it's a big strategic investor. We're trying to build up a track record. That means that we mean business, that we do what we say. Uh, it's transformed into practice and it's here to stay. You know, The deals, they're irreversible. Once the private uh, company, foreign, local, uh, once the, the ownership is transferred, it's irreversible. And in terms of legal foundations of this, we are aware of that, so that we will have to put all the instruments, all the documents, etc., in place, that this process is here to stay. It's for good, because uh, that means that, uh, you know, we, we mean business and that we want more investors to come to Uzbekistan. Well, shortly, this is uh, yeah, what I wanted to mention. Thank you so much. And uh, enjoy uh, this week. I hope uh, you will uh, you will get all the information you needed. Thank you. Is it working now? As I was saying, thank you very much to Mr. Mohamed Khulov because he's given us a very clear insight into the anatomy of the privatization process. Uh, during the course of today, the morning session, you've heard from the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Finance, two key government institutions uh, about their clear and unequivocal support for business, underpinned by emphasis on the rule of law. Uh, Mr. Nudinov has explained the way in which the state asset uh, agency for public-private partnership is working, and you've heard how state assets are being managed and privatized. Tom Schneider has given you his insight into the new arbitration law and how it complies with the model law. It's now over to you, for those of you who are interested in making any observations or asking any questions, Mr. Mohamed Khulof is kindly uh, available to answer a couple of questions. And Tom is sitting with his uh, stunning background of Dubai, 
waiting to answer any questions that you may have about the new law. Over to you, anybody? Uh, there's, there's no microphone, so if you can just shout out loud and I'll re re repeat the question. There is a microphone, sorry. Thanks. Thank you again. Um, uh, my name is John McGowan. I'm with Global Advocacy and Legal Counsel. Uh, question for Mr. Mohammed and, and for uh, Mr. Or uh, Tom, uh, but I'll start with Mr. Mohammed. Uh, the assets that are available for sale, uh, is there um, certain restrictions as to who, who may purchase, uh, you know, assets A, B, and C, you know, for something like the Hyatt Regency, which is an amazing deal, by the way. Um, uh, I'm sure I would imagine there's not a restriction, but for other assets, I'm sure there, there may be. Um, so could you, you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, I'll take that up. Uh, it's a good question, actually. It's a very good question, John. So um, let, let's go like this. So when, when we, when we, whenever we actually put up anything, we decide to proceed with, with sale. We, we seek uh, assistance of uh, our lead advisor for the deal. Usually it's a financial consultancy or big four. And depending on the size of the asset, depending on strategic value of the asset to the government, to the country, depending on the location of the asset, we usually develop qualification requirements. What that means is what we, we want the buyer that comes in, that is no speculation, you know, that buy and sell in three years time. We want the asset to develop. So we usually ask our future buyers to put down the plan for development of the asset. Usually that sort of plan can be done if it's a strategic buyer by someone who really knows the field, really knows this industry, really knows that type of a production and can actually take the company forward. So that we call uh, preliminary or whatever you call it, qualification requirements. The strictness of the qualification requirements will end on the size of the asset. So if this, if this asset is a large one forming the whole town or something, then, then we would we, want to know what will happen with the asset down the road, right? So there are no restrictions on who will bid for the asset, but we want to know that whoever is the buyer will really put the heart and soul into this company and develop the company. That can usually, we believe, that can usually be done by somebody who is committed to this deal and somebody who knows how to how to take that company in this or that field forward. So in that sense, sure, anybody can bid, but can anybody take the company forward? Then it's, that's, it's a question. Then it's already a certain kind of selection. That's how we use, that's how we use our, it's not, the, the, the decision is not taken by one person. There is a special commission within the government all the way up to the cabinet of ministers that, that compares the bids, but the bids apart from the financial side of things will also have uh, this plan, development plan for the company. So, so, so that way we, we want to know who the buyer is, what sort of uh, qualifications, what sort of know-how, what sort of, uh, you know, modern approaches that Peter will bring. So that's how we, if, if I answered your question. For uh, Tom, are you still there, Tom? I am indeed, John. Okay. Great. Um, uh, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, Article 54 of the new law, what, what, what does that mean when um, the, the government entities can, can weigh in? Is that an ex post facto uh, commentary on the award or explanation? What's your take on that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, John. And I think, frankly, it remains to be seen. Um, this is a unique provision. I haven't seen anything like it before in any other uh, national arbitration law. What I will say is that I, I do think it's aimed more at sort of um, 
publicity and capacity building and, and, and features of that sort. It, it's not necessary, it, it's not a mechanism uh, for the government to weigh in on uh, you know, particular arbitration awards, to weigh in on the interpretation of the law itself or anything like that. I think it's more focused on public awareness, capacity building and the like. Thank you, Tom. There's time for one more question. If anybody would like to ask a question or make an observation. Domenico, Joe, tempted? Oh, it's the, the allure of lunch is irresistible, is it? In which case, thank you all very much for uh, joining during this extremely informative uh, morning session. And now we'll adjourn for lunch and I understand we're reconvening at two o'clock. Yeah, just once again, on behalf of the organizing committee of the Uzbek Arbitration Week, we would like to thank our platinum sponsors, the United States Agency for International Development and GST LLB. We thank you very much for your support. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your lunch.